All right, we've covered a lot of ground in James. It uh, has proven to be a fascinating book. And again, this is the what appears to be by the listing of the names of Jesus's brothers. He appears, perhaps he's the oldest one or the, the next to the oldest. And so he has covered a tremendous amount. Uh, later on, I want to project something or share something on the screen that um, I found from the MacArthur Bible Handbook. And it is fascinating because it shows, it just lays out a comparison between points that Jesus Christ made in the Sermon on the Mount, and then the same points James focused on in this very gospel. So it's uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of parallels, a lot of connections. It's uh, almost like they grew up in the same house. Well, I guess they did. So, all right, chapter four. Let's go ahead and just uh, jump in there. Uh, verse one, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? I want to go ahead and read the next couple of verses and then we'll come back and comment on these. Verse two, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So as we see here in the notes, we have a battle, we have a struggle. The Apostle John in his first epistle, he mentioned that we have a battle with the world, with Satan the devil and with ourselves. And there are reasons for conflict and there are reasons for not having an answer that we might expect that we uh, oftentimes we ask for things uh, in such a way that we're trying to get God to give us what we want rather than going to God in prayer, asking God to just simply open our minds so that we can see what it is that he wants us to understand and uh, to seek his will. So the basic question of James, do we aim in life to submit to the will of God? Or are we seeking to gratify human desires and seek the pleasures of life in this world? Uh, by nature, humans cut off from God will seek pleasure. The focus is on self. And the quest to please one's own passions and lust leads to a lot of wars and battles that have taken place over the last 6,000 years. The root cause for this bitter conflict is improper desire. And it's improper because it's out of harmony with the will and the mind of God. Improper desire is at the root of all kinds of evil and will ruin lives and will divide people, drive wedges between people. Now, a couple of other scriptures here that would add a bit to this. In Luke 8, verse 14, and I realize most of you can see it right there on the screen. But this is uh, taken from the parable of the sower, Luke's version, Luke's, par uh, Luke's uh, account. And verse 14, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. So he speaks here of that which just uh, the pleasures of life that often take precedence and then uh, uh, move the the things of God out of our mind and out of out of sight out of mind we're seeking the to please the flesh also Titus 3 verses 3 through 5 all writing Titus for we ourselves were also once foolish disobedient deceived serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, uh, not through the washing of, or through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. 
So again, the the choice goes back to the very beginning, doesn't it? In the Garden of Eden, there were two very symbolic trees, and there is seeking God and the tree of life, um, picturing the way of God and everything to be desired. And then there was the other tree that uh, uh, presumed for oneself the prerogative to make decisions about what is right and what is wrong. And now for 6,000 years, we've seen the end result of that. Um, we focus, uh, a focus on oneself uh, leads, leads to setting men at each other's throat, driving us to shameful contact and shuts the door of prayer. If our prayers are selfish, then God doesn't hear, certainly doesn't respond in the way we might think. Moving a few more verses. Well, before I leave that, after we make our petition of God in prayer, the true way to end any prayer is what Jesus taught us in the, in the, the model prayer. Thy will be done or your will be done. And no one can properly pray until we get self and our own improper desires out of the way. Those tend to take the center of our life. We have to make God the center, that we want God's will above our own, even at times when the will of God hurts. Because there are times when, well, the Day of Atonement, we are commanded to fast. And that's about the last thing any of us really wants to do, but it's the first thing we need to do. But he did say, you ask amiss. How do we do that? Well, any prayer that's not in line with the will of God is asking amiss. We pray to, or, to understand God's will. Now, 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So if we ask contrary to the law, we ask amiss. And so Ephesians 5 verse 20 reminds us, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, so much of our prayers needs to be just simply that of praising and thanking God for all of the blessings he pours out on us. And Colossians 3, verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So when we pray, our prayers are in the name of Jesus Christ. He is the mediator. He is the one that makes, makes it possible for us to have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship and a, approach the Father uh, in heaven. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. So. We commented on this sometime in recent weeks, but before we leave these first verses, I want to, I want to be, we should be reminded that at this time, John, or excuse me, James writing probably the earlier part of the 60s AD, so a little past the middle of the first century, Rome had battles. And yet, most of those battles had been settled. There were, well, the chief place where the Romans had wars that were raging was way over to the east, over around Parthia. Now, Parthia, anciently, think of modern-day Iran, over that area beyond Iraq. That happens to be an area where uh, many of the migrating tribes of Israel happened to be at that time. Another place, I, I just finished rereading a book, St. Paul in Britain, and uh, it's a fascinating book, but it uh, goes into uh, some of the struggles, the battles the Romans had with some of the, um, the peoples who were there. They too were some of the Israelites who had migrated there early on. And so those two areas, so it's interesting since he addressed the book in chapter one to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, 
Uh, yes, primarily spiritually, the Israel of God, the church. But also we see little clues that there was a message perhaps for those of, who were physical descendants of Israel at that time. Now, let's pick it up with verse 4. We'll read down through verse 7. Adulterers and adulteresses, not very pleasant terms that he's calling them. Um, one who is an adulterer or adulteress uh, has uh, been um, unfaithful. And so he's writing to people who had been in the church and were not being faithful to God. Do you not know? that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Again, uh, there are two ways of life. It has to be one or it has to be the other. We have to live in the world right now, but we're told don't be of the world, and there is a big difference. On the other hand, you can be in the world and be fully immersed into the world and the way it, it does things. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns zealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And that's quoting from back in uh, Proverbs 3, verse 34. Verse 7, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that's a, a basic promise that God makes to us. We do not have to go around fearing that Satan will have his way with us. As long as we draw close to God, seek God's protection, ask God's angels, to, or God to send his angels to be around us, we don't have to go through life just living in fear that a demon or demons will be coming after us. But uh, again, I've got the verse there we're very familiar with in 1 John 2. Uh, don't love the world nor the things of the world. Now, the, this word in the English world comes from the Greek word cosmos in all these cases. And so it's referring to the system, the the method of operation, the mores, the, just the way the world operates. And we are to love the people of the world. In fact, that's why we signed on when we had the, received the calling of God. We signed on to be a part of a, of a work, a group of people to lock arms and, and take the pearl of great price to as many who will pick it up, to sow the seeds of the kingdom far and wide, and of course, then it's largely response or God's responsibility, and also that individual's responsibility, whether they really do anything with what they find. But in John's statement there, verse 16, he refers to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, uh, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away. It is interesting that all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Satan came along, and he had this discussion with Adam and Eve. He offered them these very things. Lust of the flesh. Isn't this fruit wonderful to look at? Lust of the eyes. They wanted the power that was there. Uh, the pride of life. They wanted the, the, the easy road to, uh, to power. When Christ was about to enter his ministry, while on the earth. He went to the desert, fasted the 40 days and 40 nights. Here came the tempter. He uses the same exact methods. Um, physical things, power, and pride. And now we need to remember, as he writes here, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Satan hasn't gone anywhere. He uses the same tactics. He's going to see if he can find the door to, to, our, to open our mind as well. So James is referring to committing adultery spiritually and departing from God to pursue the world. And I have some scriptures that would tie in that are on the screen here. 
Revelation 18, 4, as far as end time Babylon, come out of her, my people. Now, in that prophecy, Babylon's about to go down, but it's a message for us today. Come out of the world. Don't be tainted by being in the world. Jeremiah 3, verse 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel. And of course, in another place, he said, I was married to you. And of course, his wife left him. And But when Christ died, that ended that uh, marriage type covenant. Romans 6, verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Again, the two paths, it's one way or the other. So to disobey God is committing spiritual adultery. In verse 5, we read, quotes from he is a quote as a quote from scripture the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously now you can't find a scripture where that's an exact quotation there's a statement back to the days of noah and the flood as far as the world at that time and uh, which seems to be similar but it may have been something that was passed down orally as well but um, there is a, a spirit and the spirit of god is jealous in a righteous way and god himself is jealous over us that we do not depart just as any spouse in a marriage would be righteously jealous that their spouse not leave and go follow someone else. So jealousy, generally we think of it in a negative vein, but it can be something right and good. Even Exodus 20 verse 5, we find that it's it's written right there into the Ten Commandments in the midst of the, the Second Commandments. Uh, second Commandment verse 5, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God, him, God describes himself as being jealous, not wanting, in this case, physical Israel to depart from him. And he doesn't want us, as members of spiritual Israel, to depart either. James speaks of the pride. It means a person sees himself as being above others. Verse 7, submit to God. That's the answer. And then he promises, resist the devil and he will flee. We resist in God's name. And we use the name of Jesus Christ. But uh, humility, humility is the path we follow. Hebrews 4, verse 16 mentions Christ in his, um, his intercessory work, work for us. We go to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace for help in time of need. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, Paul made the statement that we, as far as Satan, we are not ignorant of his devices. And let's not assume that we remember all of his devices. Uh, here are many listed. It's not an all-inclusive list. Satan will try one, and if, if that window won't open, he'll try the door, he'll try another window, he'll try all different means to try to gain access to our, to our lives, to our mind. For each person, there's a different weak point. It seems we all have one or two really big struggles that we have in life. And then there are all these other things that are out there too. But Satan uses pride. He appealed to the Eve, your pride. Look at this fruit. He, pride, uh, uh, he uh, 
went after Christ as far as pride. Uh, there's lying. Old Testament talks about lying spirits. New Testament, Jesus said he, Satan is the father of liars. There is lust. There's jealousy. That's an improper jealousy. There's a spirit of rebellion that First Samuel said is like the, the sin of witchcraft. There's bitterness. Bitterness. It's so difficult when a person becomes bitter, so difficult to ever recover and come out of that. There is discouragement. There's envy, negativity, doubt, division. These are all fruits of the mind of Satan, the devil. And these are the very tools that he uses to try to seek access to gain or to gain access to our mind. Continuing in verse eight, we read, therefore submit to God, resist the devil. I'm reading verse seven again. Let's go to verse eight. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And that's, uh, again, that's cause and effect as well. But um, James here, remember we said in an earlier one, how many of these imperative statements he makes. Uh, we have a lot of them in, in these last two chapters. But he is stressing that there is an effort. There's a moral effort that is of primary importance. Uh, cleansing our hands will include cleansing the heart. Uh, the Old Testament, of course, had a system that involved various uh, outward washings of the flesh. But God wants a clean heart. He wants to be able to cleanse our heart. And Peter made a similar statement, but he added a little more. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. So very similar statement in thought that what James wrote. But here James speaks of a kind of a fourfold cleansing. Uh, the lips, he had a lot to write about that that we covered, the words that we speak in chapter three. And yet God can cleanse that. Remember in Isaiah chapter six, how when uh, you know, the question at heaven was asked, whom shall we send? And Isaiah said, here I am. But he was a man of unclean lips. But then the seraph flew with a live coal and touched his mouth and, he, and his lips were cleansed. There's a, a cleansing of, of the hand and chap, uh, hands. What we do, our efforts, our works. Chapter two, he spent a, a great deal talking about how we need to live our faith. We need to demonstrate our faith by the way we live life, the works of, of service that we perform. Uh, purifying, washing the heart. And that's what we're reading about here. And also the mind, purifying the mind. But the Bible consistently teaches that humility will see us through. Those who are humble will be blessed by God. I have three or four, let's see, four verses here that we can look at. Perhaps you can make a, a quick note. But if he, or excuse me, Proverbs 3.34, what James quoted just up in, uh, up in verse 6 comes from Proverbs 3.34. Um, as far as uh, God scorns the, the scornful but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 29, verse 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. You know, a statement like that, there's an awful lot to, to just 
meditate on all that is covered in that he inhabits eternity whose name is holy and then this quoting from god i dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble to revive the heart of the contrite ones so there god is telling us through isaiah he's looking to those who walk the path of humility and then matthew 23 verse 12 jesus of course strongly condemning and correcting the pharisees he said whoever exalts himself will be humbled but he who humbles himself will be exalted so we humble ourselves by fasting when we fast it's it's amazing i i'm i'm amazed at how different i am i i'm a better driver <laughs> Some, somebody pulls out and they should have waited. Uh, I don't care. Uh, somebody cuts me off. I just slow down. I don't care. But I wish I could tell you that at other times when I'm not fasting, that I just react in a, in a calm Christian way. But there are times when there's a battle going on. And it's, it's still being waged. Uh, William Barclay, on, this, on these verses here, um, from this, I've showed you this, this uh, daily Bible study. This is the, the volume on the epistles of James and First and Second Peter. But on this verse, he says, in life, there is one sin, which can be said to be the basis of all others. And that is forgetting that we are the creatures and that God is the creator. And there's a lot right there, a lot of truth right there. We are the created sons and daughters of Almighty God. We are in his image and likeness. God is the creator. Too many times the created speaks against or ignores or walks away from the creator. But when we realize that our, as he continues, when we realize our essential creatureliness i don't know if he coined a word there we realize that our essential helplessness and go to the only source from which our helplessness can find assistance and that is where we go to god where do we go to god his last sentence there as long as we regard ourselves as independent of god we are on the way to ultimate collapse and defeat well, let's go to verses 11 and 12. 11 and 12. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges a brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver. So in part, he's saying, that job is taken, and it's not our job. It's God's. Who is able to save and to destroy? Who are you to judge another? But you know, as human beings, we make these judgments. We make so many. We judge people, and uh, we condemn people. And that's above our pay grade. You know, there are Greek words we could go into, krino. Crino, judge not that you be not judged. That's crino, and that's based on what's in a person's heart. You and I do not know what is in that other person's heart. That is in the realm of God. There's another word, criterion. Paul told the Corinthians, you should be able to judge these simple matters between you. And that was criterion, where it's a judgment call based upon a standard, in this case, the law of God. But uh, we pick up the Bible, we apply it to the person we look at and we see in the mirror, not to others. Uh, there's a Greek word, katalalian. It means to speak harshly of or to slander. And there's so much slander, so much slander. We see that in the world of politics all around us. 
who in their right mind would want to run for public office, certainly national office, because you have a, a life-size target on your backside. God is a lawgiver. We are not. Well, here are some couple of passages you could tie in here. Isaiah 33, verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And the law that God has given is so important. Romans 4, verse 15 tells us where there is no law, there's no transgression. And uh, he makes it clear that by the law, we understand what sin is. So our duty is not to judge the law, but rather obey the law. Judge, a, judge and condemn a brother is to commit slander. And the law tells us we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we're, we're even to pray for those that despitefully use us. Slander it fringes into that area where it's in the, the prerogative of God that hasn't been given to us. Verse 13, in his latter few verses of chapter 13, uh, he talks about, and we've all done it. He says, come now, verse 13, you who say, tomorrow, uh, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him, who knows to do good and does it not does not do it to him it is sin. So we're reminded here we must always consider the will of God. Now this does not say we don't make plans. We do plan, but we always realize the will of God may trump what we plan. It may overrule what we plan. We always follow. When we understand the will of God, if it's different than what we've been planning, we, we change, we correct the course. There are so many uncertainties of life we have no control over. Uh, we certainly don't sit there with an action, afraid to do anything. But Paul wrote to Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 19. And he wanted to come to them again. He said, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And Paul had traveled a lot already, and there were times when that door just wasn't open. And one time he said, but Satan hindered us. Chapter 16, verse 7, for I do not wish to see, um, to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you, if the Lord permits. If the Lord permits. So we commit our plans the sovereign hands of God and realize that we may plan and find it's not within God's will for us. Proverbs 3 27. We read that last verse to him that knows the good do good and does it not to him it's sin. Well Proverbs 3 27 do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do it. So let's go on to chapter five. We largely have five themes that he touches on. There's correction of the rich. There's the need for patience. He speaks further about prayer and then just a few basic ex uh, various exhortations at the end. Well, let's, let's go to verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. 
So he castigates the rich for genuine abuses. Now he is not, he is not condemning wealth. There are many examples we could look at who were very rich. It says that of Abraham and Lot with him. It says it of David. It says it of Solomon. Um, they used, they largely used their wealth in a godly way. Not perfectly. But wealth doesn't last. Not a one of us will take riches. Our savings account will not go into the kingdom. And even these, uh, what seem to be in incorruptible items like gold and silver, you might think they'll always be here. Well, well, you may wake up one morning and find that uh, three quarters of the value is lost as well. Proverbs eleven twenty eight: He who trusts in his riches will fall. Luke eighteen verse twenty four: Jesus said, "How hard it is." For those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. He didn't say it was impossible. It's hard. The wealth can have a way of turning their focus in life elsewhere. 1 Timothy 6 verses 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich. Now that's not condemning wanting to better yourself and have a better standard of living for you, for your family. Uh, those, those are right and good things. But if it becomes, um, there's, a, there's a line out there and it, it can become lust. But he who trusts in his riches, I'm, pardon, I'm going back up here. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts. Verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, or which some have strayed from the truth and in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Uh, in that passage, he also uses the example of Solomon. Uh, Solomon's reign began with just what, what an am amazing renewal it was. How wonderful it sounded when God appeared to him and said, tell me what you want. And he wanted an understanding heart to judge this, you're so great a people. And it took off with a, like gangbusters. And yet in time, his wives, he, all these foreign wives and mainly other religions that were represented and his heart was turned. Well, the Bible, in these verses speaks out against social injustice uh, does not condemn wealth but i think it's right to say that with wealth there's a responsibility to use it wisely you know we had some you look look at all the multi multi-millionaires from back in america's gilded age there from reconstruction through world war one uh you had uh, the Rockefellers, and you had also uh, Carnegie's. But you know, as a kid growing up in our county seat, when we'd go to the town, uh, I'd often be dropped off at the Carnegie Library. And um, a lot of his wealth was spent giving back and providing for those that didn't have the same. But you look at all of these of the greatest wealth you know, Bill Gates, I saw him on the news today, Bill Gates, one day his life will end, just like yours, just like mine. He won't take all of that money with him. He won't. Years ago, Sam Walton died and uh, he didn't take any of it with him. So only godly, righteous character transcends this life and steps into eternity in the family of God. Well, verse, uh, verse four. Verse four, indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed the fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. So he gets a little more specific. They were abusing, they were taking advantage. They had gained their wealth by injustice. 
they were dishonest. And it reminds them the laborer is worthy of his hire. So, verse five, you've lived on earth in lux pleasure and luxury. You fattened your hearts. Uh, verse six, you have condemned, you have murdered the just. You know, to withhold what that laborer deserved just may have been a life and death matter to that man and family. He does not resist you. Uh, you can make a note if you so desire here of Deuteronomy 24, verses 14 and 15. And uh, I think the the key point here is the latter part of verse 15. Lest he cry out against you to the Lord and it be sin to you. God is always spoken of as looking after the poor, the needy, the, the orphan, the widow. Jeremiah 22 talks about building a house by unrighteousness. 22 verse 13. Malachi 3, verse 5, Malachi wrote about exploiting wage earners and widows and orphans. Well, cries of laborers, cries of widows, cries of orphans reach the God in heaven. And he's very, very concerned about the rights of the hardworking person who's out there giving it his or her all. And they deserve to be paid for their labor. So he, he spoke about the rich, the wealthy early on in his book about being given the chief seats there at the, at the Sabbaths, but, but there are many pitfalls. Um, rich tend to want to hang on to what they have. Well, don't we all? But if it is at the expense of realizing there are those who need help and they do nothing. Somewhere along the line, it's like the last chapter ended, to him that knows to do good and does it not to him it's sin. There oftentimes can be a greed that is engendered. They want more and they want more. Uh, they attract so-called friends who love them, uh, love them in quotes, love in quotes, the money, more than the person. Sometimes the money can be, the wealth can become idolatry. And money is power. It can become power. So Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Matthew 6, verse 21. Well, let's, uh, let's keep going. Clock is ticking here. Let's go to verse 7. Verses 7 through 9. Therefore, be patient. So now he shifts into this other theme he wants to, to come back to and focus on a little more. Be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So patiently waiting, looking for the coming of God, of Christ. Now, it speaks here of the uh, the early and the latter rains. In verse seven, uh, Deuteronomy eleven verse fourteen. Then I'll give you the rain for your land in its season: the early rain and the latter rain. Well, the early rains came in the fall after the feast. October into November, the rains would fall. They had the moisture in the soil for seed to germinate. And then in the spring, around just after unleavened bread, the latter rain, rains came. And that was necessary to bring the crops on into maturity so that First, the, the barley could be harvested, followed by in the wheat. But you see, a, a farmer has to learn patience. He waits until God sends those rains. Likewise, all of us as Christians need to exercise patience as we wait until 
it's exactly right in God's time and he sends Jesus to bring the kingdom to this earth. Some of this I may have to skip over because we're uh, we're down to a few minutes, but Barclay commented on, commented on three Greek words that are used to describe. Uh, verse eight ended with the coming of the Lord is at hand. Uh, there is this, uh, this word uh, parousia, which refers to the second coming of Christ as the King of Kings. There's another word that refers to his appearing before the world, standing there as the sovereign, and another one standing there in his glory, in his invincible power, omnipotent power. Um, while we wait, there are many dangers. While we wait, we have to be on guard. We have to be watching. Uh, when waiting is postponed from our point of view. When we wait and we wait and we wait, it can lead to despair. But in the meantime, we're to set our own houses in order and keep them in order. And when he comes, he wants to remain, he wants us to find us there, a part of the body doing the work of God. Lamentations 3, verse 26. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Many times we're told we don't know the day or the hour. We wait, but we wait in a state of preparation. Matthew 24, verse 42 says, Watch therefore, you don't know what hour the Lord is coming. Verse 44, therefore be ready. So those two have to go together, watching, but that's of no value unless we also are ready. All right, verse 10. Verse 10, my brethren, take the prophets. I think I already read that one. As an, Yes, the prophets as an example of suffering and patience. There are so many examples we could go to. Uh, think of Noah. Uh, he had a 120-year job of building an ark and being a preacher of righteousness. Uh, Abraham, we're introduced to him at age 75 and He's told, get up and leave, go to the place I'll show you. And in short order, he's promised, I'm going to give you a son. 25 years later, they got that son. Moses, his life is divided into three 40-year periods. And he spent a lot of time, just logging time. He went through, he went through the, uh, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness with them. Job, we're familiar with that. Hannah, how long did Hannah go crying out? She wanted that son. Jeremiah, he had a long, long ministry. Verse 11, indeed we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And thank God that he is, because we desperately need God's mercy. Verse 12, speaks of the folly of making oaths. Do not swear, either by heaven or by earth. Let your yes be yes, your no, no. And that's one of the parallels because Jesus made a similar statement in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I just give you these verses, Matthew 5, 37, 38. Um, Jesus says, don't swear. Don't swear falsely. Don't. Uh, essentially, it's unwise to make oaths, to take oaths. Uh, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Um, every word that is spoken is spoken in the presence of our God. Therefore, it ought to be true and right and edifying. Verse uh, 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Oil representing the power of God's spirit by which he works in our lives. Paul even set the example of sending out 
pieces of cloth that had been anointed with oil and prayed over. And as it says, if sins are involved, God forgives. But if you're sick, call. When do you call? Well, that's up to each individual. Everyone makes that determination at a different time. Uh, God, nothing says the situation has to be life-threatening. But uh, we need to be thinking of God first. We have an injury. We have a disease. We have whatever condition. Think of God first. Get God involved. Then go and see and make a decision as far as what man may or may not be able to do. Um, the Bible does not condemn doctors. Matthew 9, verse 12, Jesus said, those who are well don't need a doctor, don't need a physician, but those who are sick. And he told the story of the good Samaritan. The Samaritan was the one with the man who went and treated his wounds and cared for him. And Luke was called the beloved physician who traveled with Paul. And who knows how many times he's binding up Paul's injuries, maybe being injured along with him. Um, but bottom line, no, no doctor can keep God from healing us. Uh, we go to God in faith. We ask for anointing in faith. The prayer of faith, our prayer, the faith of all brethren. Um, if God decides to heal, he speaks the word and it's done. Like, who was it? The centurion, I think it was, that said, you know, Lord, you don't need to come to my house. Speak the word and it'll be done. This man was a military man. He knew what it meant speak the word and it happens verse 16 confess your trespasses to one another uh, i would say we uh, we confess sin to god if we have a great struggle uh, we are really struggling with overcoming something um, it is okay to get others to be involved praying for you uh, that's right and good uh, I would be, I would caution being discreet um, because sometimes you can, you can give out too much information in some situations. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He gives the example of Elijah. He prayed that it not rain and it didn't, re didn't rain for three years and a half. He prayed again and it rained and the earth produced its fruit. So James is telling them we need to be a praying church and beware of setting limitations on the power of prayer. And who knows, on any given day, you might be the one whose prayer of faith God hears, honors, and answers and acts. Okay, last couple of verses. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So what a supreme accomplishment it is to be used as the tool of God, not by our own power, never is, but to be used by the power of God to bring someone back. To have enough love sometimes to exercise tough love in wisdom. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, all right, pause there. If you're not close to God, don't touch it. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. No going there in a Sherman tank to run them over. No, uh, you know, no condemnatory spirit. Very gentle, realizing we have similar struggles. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law, law of Christ. We are our brother's keepers. So God can use any one of us to help someone 
you know, turn someone back to God, back to the church. But again, spirit of gentleness and humility. But I'm going to take down these notes and let me see if. Okay, do you see this one? James and the Sermon on the Mount, okay. All right, James and the Sermon on the Mount. So um, left column and here at the bottom, this comes from the MacArthur Bible Handbook. So it is copyrighted and the New King James references are copyrighted by Thomas Nelson, but for educational purposes, it's my understanding we can give handouts. Um, but I, you know, is it just, it's phenomenal to look at. Here's the reference in the left column, the chapter and verse or verses from James. Then the next column, the Sermon on the Mount. Most of these from Matthew, but once in a while, it's also, there's a reference to Luke. And then the subject, the topic. And so I'm going to email that to everyone so that you'll have that. I think it's good material to have the file away. Uh, and if you happen to have the MacArthur Bible Handbook, you already have access to it. But uh, it's interesting. As I said earlier here, James is writing along so many of the very topics his brother Jesus covered in the Sermon on the Mount that was at a time when James was one of the brothers where the Bible says his brothers did not believe him. But some dramatic changes have come along. So let me take that down.